welcome back after the break. Um, Sean Kelly needs no introduction, but uh, nonetheless, it's very nice to introduce you. Uh, he's Theresa G. and Ferdinand F. Martinetti, Professor of Philosophy at Harvard University and former chair of the department. Amongst his major interests are philosophy of perception, philosophy of literature, and French and German philosophy. His books include The Relevance of Phenomenology to the Philosophy of Language and Mind and with Hubert Dreyfus, All Things Shining, Reading the Western Classics to Find Meaning in a Secular Age. And Sean's talking to us today about wandering at the inhuman gaze. Just. Okay, thank you, Tim, and thank you, Anya, uh, for this conference, for this great conference. I Just a few words of introduction. I, um, I took very seriously um, Anya's charge that we think about the inhuman gaze. So I tried to write something about that, and as I began thinking about it, uh, it seemed to me there were two natural things to focus on when you thought about an inhuman gaze. Somehow the idea that things might gaze at you, because things are not human, and at the very opposite end of the sort of spectrum, the idea that God might gaze at you, which is a traditional old idea. And so I was trying to think about how to bring those together. Uh, I spent the spring semester teaching uh, a course on later Heidegger, which led me to think more than I ever have or ever thought I would about um, medieval Christian mysticism. And I discovered in the context of the medieval Christian mystics that these two things do come together. So that's, um, I, so I'll talk about that. Um, the, the paper has two parts. Part of it is rather unfamiliar, at least it was to me, it sort of takes place in the 15th century, and since it's so unfamiliar, I'll talk a little more about that uh, than I will about the second part, which is more contemporary and stands in stark contrast to the first part. Uh, so, to begin, uh, we start out in the year 1453. It's October. I'll try to tell this as a story, because I know I'm standing between you and dinner, <laughs> and so I'll, I'll try to give you some sense of the excitement of the thing. So here we are in the ancient monastic community nestled along the banks of Lake Tergensi in the Bavarian Alps. Uh, and there the brothers have finally received a promised and much anticipated treatise. It has been sent by the bishop overseeing uh, the reform of their mountain diocese the great Renaissance figure, Nicholas of Cusa, 1401 to 1464. So Nicholas had been to this um, abbey before, the year before, June 22nd to 27th, 1452, and the community um, was enthusiastic about his ideas, and he was happy about this because he was at the time under quite a lot of attack by other members of the Christian world, uh, in particular, he was under attack for two different sort of ways of being involved in what was called a mystical heresy. So the first kind of mystical heresy uh, involved uh, his rejection or apparent rejection of the Aristotelian laws of logic in the context of his philosophical theology. It seemed as though his metaphysics committed him to rejecting uh, some of the laws of Aristotelian logic, and since they were so central to medieval scholastic th uh, theology, this was considered a kind of heresy. And Nicholas responded in a way that I think is relevant and interesting for his connection with Heidegger. Nicholas said, well, I do reject some of the laws of Aristotelian logic, for instance, the principle of non-contradiction, but only in a very circumscribed context. If you're talking about objects, discrete objects, then the law of non-contradiction holds perfectly well. It's never the case. It's a sort of logical impossibility that for a given object, O, it could both be the case that P and not P applies to O at a given time in a given way. But the thing is that God isn't an object, Nicholas said in 1450. Uh, he, God lies beyond all distinction. Uh, he's not an entity distinct from other entities, Nicholas says, but he is... Uh, the ground of all entities while not being an entity himself. So if you know anything about Heidegger, either early or late, you can understand why someone uh, developing a claim like that might be interesting to him. Indeed, Nicholas said, in his infinity, 
God is the coincidence of opposites, the coming together of all opposites. Uh, and to treat him as simply another entity, another being, Nicholas claimed is a form of idolatry. Uh, as a result, since, since God is not an entity, the principle of non-contradiction doesn't apply to God, nor to the mystical union with God, which is some kind of experience we can have in, uh, of a relation to God, which is not just some kind of experience, but the very goal of the Christian life, the foundational experience. So that's one kind of um, concern that people had about Nicholas's views. A second concern is more complicated, and I'll only treat it very cursorily in order to bring up uh, something related. The second complaint had to do with a complicated and detailed debate in the 15th century and before, starting in the 13th century, uh, between what are now called uh, affective and intellective Dionysians. The Dionysius here is Pseudo-Dionysius the Areopagite, the 5th century Christian mystic, who's the source of an awful lot of medieval Christian mysticism. And this debate between the affective and the intellective Dionysians is largely a debate about how to interpret what Dionysius thought we were up to when we were bringing ourselves to this point of mystical union with God. Uh, Albert the Great, Albertus Magnus, the teacher of Aquinas in the, in the 13th century, had sort of laid the groundwork by defining uh, what's now understood as the intellective form of this kind of uh, mysticism. Albert said, it's necessary uh, to be united to God through intellect and to praise him by word. So somehow the activity of the intellect is involved in bringing you to this um, sort of amazing point. Uh, but then the affective mystics thought that it wasn't primarily the activity of the intellect that was involved in bringing you to this point of mystical union. It was somehow some kind of mood. Uh, now both sides, of course, believed that the intellect and the affect were uh, both involved. It's just a matter of which they give priority to. But Nicholas gives priority to the affective aspect of this activity that's supposed to bring you to union with God. And uh, that's another way in which it seems to me this emphasis on the affect, on mood, uh, which is somehow what pervades the whole of your experience. That's another way in which um, this kind of view could become uh, important for, for Heidegger, again, early and late. Now, um, uh, this, this is important only because there's a sort of subsidiary set of issues that arise uh, in the context of this debate. And the main one that I want to focus on has to do with the question, what it means to see God. So there's a kind of experience, a, a putatively visual experience, although it's not uh, obviously visual, um, because what you see when you see God is you see him in his divine hiddenness. You see what uh, one can't see. Uh, and you see that in the form of a face-to-face -face vision of the sort that is promised in a variety of different biblical texts. So in his divine infinity, as the coincidence of opposites, Nicholas's God, it seems to me, is the essence of what's inhuman. Uh, that, that's just not what we are. Uh, and yet, to gaze upon him, and to gaze upon, and to be gazed upon by him, is for Nicholas the highest form of human being. So, the question is, how do you get to have this experience? The uh, treatise that Nicholas sent to the community in Targency in October of 1453 is devoted to the exploration of this kind of inhuman gaze, and to the kind of practice you'd have to undergo in order to be able to experience it yourself. The goal of Nicholas' book is to provide a series of exercises in seeing, hearing, moving, speaking, and being together with one another uh, that will lead his audience toward what he calls the wonders which are revealed beyond all sensible, rational, and intellectual sight. Um, it's to prove to them that this is an experience that anyone can come to have if you just do the, the appropriate, the spiritual exercises in the appropriate way. Uh, the title of the treatise is De Visione Dei, On the Vision of God. The Dei, the God, is in the genitive there. 
And I think um, that makes it ambiguous in just the right way, uh, in, in the way that Nicholas wants. God is both the subject whose vision is directed towards us at all times and all places, and he's also the object of our own vision in the mystical experience. It's both a subjective and objective genitive. So the gaze of God is inhuman for Nicholas, not only because God is not an entity, but moreover because as a result of him not being an entity or related to him not being an entity, there's no single place in space or time from which God gazes upon us, or rather, he gazes upon us from every place at once. His gaze is, as it's said in the literature, omnivoyant. This reminds me of a passage in Merleau Ponty that somebody quoted yesterday, I can't remember who it was, that I've been interested in for a decade or two about how uh, objects see one another and they all and they all see us from every perspective. Uh, Nicholas is saying this about God, that's what God is. So the gaze of God um, is uh, is inhuman in this way. Now, the vision of the all-seeing God is a staple. Oh, did I go past one? No, I guess not. Is a staple of uh, mystic visionary texts. Um, one thinks, for instance, of the vision of the Iron Mountain from the Ski Wias of Hildegard of Bingen. Hildegard uh, is several centuries before Nicholas. She um, wrote about the visions she had. Uh, and this is the first one, the vision of the Iron Mountain. And uh, it's a sort of complicated vision. This is her description of it. Uh, and you'll see uh, at the top, there's this very imposing figure. And there are two figures on the bottom. One of them is this striking uh, figure that she calls the Timor Domini, the fear of God. And that's a reference to a line in Psalm 111 and, and related lines elsewhere in the Bible, uh, in Itium Sapientiae Timor Domini, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the figure representing the fear of the Lord in Hildegard's vision, as you can see, is a body covered entirely with eyes. So God's inhuman and omnivoyant gaze upon us is the beginning of wisdom in the mystic tradition because now, this is my interpretation. This is why I think they think it's the beginning of wisdom. Because to experience the world as replete with God's vision is to experience oneself as looked over by, cared for, and in that way dependent upon God. This notion of dependence, which is related to our finitude, is something that Heidegger is also very interested in, though what we're dependent upon in Heidegger is not, of course, God. But the inhuman gaze in its omnivoyance is not entirely reassuring either. It, uh, oh, let's see, in revealing our dependence upon God, and in this way, therefore, our finitude, it essentially involves the recognition of our lack of control over ourselves and the world, and the fear and anxiety that go along with it. So it's on the one hand a, kind, a recognition of our dependence on something that's outside of us, uh, that's supposed to be the possibility of our salvation, but it's also, on the other hand, the giving up of our autonomy or our control uh, in the context of that, which can invoke fear and anxiety. So the trick, I think, as these medievals conceive of it and as later Christian existentialists conceive of it, uh, is to recognize this utter lack of control while at the same time finding certainty and joy within it. That is, of course, an impossible, an absurd, a paradoxical task. It's the task that I think Kierkegaard describes. Uh, here's Kierkegaard. Uh, Kierkegaard says, the night of faith, in fear and trembling, is like the dancer who, having leapt high into the air, lands straight into a definite position with absolute and unwavering certainty. Uh, let's see where it is. Indeed, uh, even in the very midst of the leap, at the utter apex of its riskiness, the dancer has already assumed with certainty the final position. So, and this is Kierkegaard writing, so that not for a second does he have to catch at the position, but stands there in it, in the leap itself. Somehow at the very apex, you're already in the position that allows you to land with complete and utter certainty as you're about to in the future. 
That's what this trick is like, uh, Kierkegaard says. So God's particular kind of inhuman gaze in this tradition grounds the possibility of such a leap. Now, this leap has a kind of fascinating, it seems to me, temporal structure to it, um, it even and maybe even especially in Kierkegaard's description of it. It is as if for the night of faith, uh, at every moment in his or her life, um, he or she experiences that moment, even in its utter riskiness, indeed in the full uh, recognition of its utter and irrevocable finitude, as a moment that already has in it the future certainty of the unwavering position in which he'll land. Indeed, there's some paradoxical sense in which he recognizes this future position as the one in which he's already landed, even here at the apex of his leap, uh, despite the fact that that event remains in the future. So that's a weird kind of phenomenology, a weird kind of experience of temporality. I think it ultimately derives from Augustine's account of time in Book 10 of the Confessions, uh, at which uh, is um, an account that underlies Augustine's account of the Christian, uh, the Christian phenomenon of hope, virtue of hope. But there's a more prosaic application of it too, and we've already heard about it yesterday. Uh, it, uh, it's highlighted in Merleau-Ponty, but Mel Goodell was talking about it as well. Uh, Merleau-Ponty describes the temporality of the act of grasping an object. He says, from the moment of the initiation uh, of the act, the grasp is already at its end point. I think that's the same temporality as the temporality that Kierkegaard is, uh, is talking about. And Christian, Nicholas's Christian form of this what we'll call it the proleptic present, the present that reaches out into the future, replete with its anticipatory joy, is grounded in the knowledge of God's omnivoyant gaze. It's somehow ex experiencing the omnivoyant gaze in the right way that gives you this kind of experience of temporality. So the trick then, the beginning of wisdom, is to be able to recognize that gaze as inhabiting the whole of everything that is. Now that's a weird phenomenon, that's a fascinating phenomenon. To experience that is not just to experience a bunch of objects, that's easy. We can experience the chair, the chair as black, the snow, the snow as white. We can experience Mary's green eyes and Beatrice's dark hair. We can experience all those things. But to see all of that, um, indeed to see every property of every object as being the way it is, but then you have to do something else. You have to, at the same time, experience in and through each and every one of these objects the very essence of the vision of God. That's quite another thing. It's to experience the objects as they are, and at the same time, in experiencing that way, to experience them as the manifestation of the gaze of God. So it's as if you have to say, everything for the person who manages to have this experience looks the same, and at the same time, they experience it all as utterly different. So you experience, the person who manages to have this experience, not only what it is, what things are now, but also the certain joy towards which uh, things are proceeding and the vision of God that sort of peeps through things and that grounds this possibility. That's the gestalt shift that I think Nicholas wants to bring about in his community of monks. And to do that, he gives them this fascinating set of exercises. So I want to describe to you just very briefly what the exercises are. Um, they just, they're sort of fascinating phenomenologically. So they, um, they organize themselves around an icon, around a picture. Nicholas says he actually sent uh, an icon with the book to Terrigancy. Uh, and he describes it. He says, look, this is the kind of icon that you see around. And he gives some examples. One is an example of a painting by Roger van der Weyden that's now lost. Um, so I give you this other painting by Roger van der Weyden that's not yet lost. Uh, but I think it has the, the feature that Nicholas claims these icons have. Um, and what they all have in common is that the image they depict contains what he says is a peculiar feature. It is, quoting Nicholas now, of someone omnivoyant, so that his face 
her face. In fact, the scholars think it was probably a her, an image of the Veronica, which is a, one of Jesus' disciples. Uh, so uh, it's an image of, of someone omnivoyant, so that his face or her face, through subtle pictorial artistry, is such that it seems to behold everything around it. So using this icon, Nicholas prescribes a, a practice that the community of monks is to engage in, and it has uh, three phases. So first phase, take the icon, hang it on the north wall of a special room that holds all of the members of the community. People spread out in the room and they gaze at the icon. They gaze at it, uh, gazing at them. And the longer you gaze at it, it's supposed to be, the deeper and more seriously you gain the experience of being gazed at by the icon. It looks as though the object that you're looking at is looking at you. That's the tr trick of subtle trick of pictorial artistry that he's talking about. So this is a first move. It's pretty important. Uh, you're supposed to luxuriate in the experience of seeing yourself being gazed upon. Now, um, this experience of being seen by the image is not identical with the experience of being seen by God. Of course, it's a thing that's looking at you. Uh, but it's sufficiently similar that Nicholas hopes by analogy achieve the second experience, the experience of being gazed at by God, through the first experience, the experience of being gazed at by the image in the icon. For one thing, both the icon and God are manifestations of the inhuman gaze. One the gaze of a thing, the other gaze, the gaze of God. But more importantly, the icon's gaze will eventually become, through the kind of miraculous transformation inherent in Nicholas's exercise, the sight of the very gaze of God himself. So they start out as separate, and then through this transformation in your experience, you come to experience that uh, looking of the icon at you as the looking of God at you. Um, so uh, at least uh, it will become one of the infinitely many places from which one can experience such a gaze. So we're, we have to go through a couple more steps. So that's the first step, experience the icon looking at you. Second step, take up a different position in the room. Now you all move, I would have you do it, but that would be too disruptive. But you should move to some other place in the room and two things happen. First of all, you're supposed to notice that it's still looking at you. <laughs> It's still looking at you, even though you're in a different position. So um, Nicholas finds this uh, paradoxical. Obviously, the eyes of the image have not moved. It's there, for, but uh, but nevertheless, it's even though you've moved, still gazing upon you. He says this is a an instantiation of a kind of unmoved mover, which is what the prime mover in Aristotle is, which is what God is supposed to be. Um, and you can get the effect not just by changing places, but by walking from one place to another, uh, staring at the icon, noticing that the gaze follows you throughout the changes in your position. And so this is, um, this is even more extraordinary. Um, the, the idea, Nicholas says, that you're, the gaze never deserts you. That's the way he describes it. It never gives you up. It never leaves you. Um, okay, so that's the, 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 the gaze is directed, seems to be at any rate directed at the monk in all his particularity, at, at whatever points in space and time he happens to occupy. Then there's this third stage in the exercise, which I find maybe the most interesting. It's a kind of intersubjective stage. It turns out um, that uh, you could never, Nicholas says, use the resources of your imagination or your cognition. Nothing you could do through an act of the will or an act of cognition on your own could bring you to the experience that you're about to have in this third stage. And the experience is this. You and a compatriot stand at opposite ends of the room, each staring at the gaze of the image gazing at you, and walk together towards one another, experiencing the gaze following you until you come together. And then this interesting thing is supposed to happen, Nicholas says. 
each of you will explain to the other that the gaze was following him. <laughs> but insofar as we believe one another, we live in this community of trust, which I think is so super crucial to being able to gain this kind of experience of intersubjectivity. Insofar as we live in this community of trust and we implicitly believe what the other person says about their experience, then we come also to experience not only that the gaze is following you wherever you go, but that it's following everyone wherever every, anyone goes. And that it's following everything wherever everything goes, wherever anything goes, and so on and so forth. So we get this, um, this is an exercise. It's an exercise that you're supposed to go through. Nicholas, I think it's interesting and important. Nicholas thinks you couldn't reason yourself to this, um, to this understanding of the omnivoyance of God, of the all-seeingness of God, of the experience of God looking at you through every object everywhere in the world. Uh, but you can bring yourself to have the experience through this kind of exercise, and uh, he recommends it. Uh, he, summarizes, um, he summarizes the exercises this way. He says, and while he considers that this gaze does not desert anyone, he, the monks, sees how diligently it is concerned for each one. You have to, I mean, it's a funny thing. You have to experience gazing at you, but it's gaze at you being a manifestation of its concern for you. Uh, but you're supposed to experience that uh, as if he were, it were concerned for no one else, but only for him who experiences that he is seen by it. This impression is so strong that the one who's being looked upon, imagine that the icon is concerned for another, the one who is pondering all this will then also notice that the image is most diligently concerned for the least of creatures and for the other monks in the room, just as for the greatest of creatures and for the whole universe. On the basis of such a sensible appearance as this, Nicholas says, I propose to elevate you, very beloved brothers, through a devotional exercise unto mystical theology. Okay, that's the exercise. I want to conclude with a couple of observations, the first part, with a couple of observations about um, this exercise, about Nicholas' conception of the inhuman gaze in its godly uh, form. The first uh, thing to notice is that the point of this exercise and the point of mystical theology generally, which is supposed to bring you to the experience of the union with God, uh, is um, that it can't, the experience can't be had, or at least Nicholas thinks it can't be had, without amazement and wonder. So that's the mood in which this experience happens. And the mood is going to serve as the background by means of which you come to experience things differently. Now, it's a particular mood. It's the mood of wonder. It's the mood of amazement. That's the word that Nicholas uses. Um, of course, that's an important mood, the mood of wonder. Heidegger talks about the mood of wonder in the 1938 lecture, Basic Questions of Philosophy. It, I, Selected problems of logic, uh, and uh, <laughs> those are his scare quotes, not mine. Um, and he says, "Well, wonder is an affective experience of the whole. It's a mood that pervades everything. It stands as the background to and determinative of what can be presented as a thing at all. So it, it's uh, it's the befindlichkeit. It's a, it's got a particular surveillance, but it's that's what it is." The inhuman gaze of God in the mystical theological tradition, it seems to me, is pervasive in precisely the way that Heidegger treats uh, wonder as pervasive when it is uh, a grounding mood. Uh, because of this, that's why I think you can't uh, achieve its experience through an act of the will, through imagination or cognition. Uh, those are spontaneous acts of the will that are directed at particular objects. And this is a background mood in the context of which any object can be uh, presented to you. Rather, you have to undertake the practical exercise, these kinds of practical exercises of moving through the world with others, attentive to and opened upon the continuous and non-locatable experience of being seen. Now, this is a particular kind of experience, this reflective experience of uh, seeing yourself being seen. Um, and I think it's essentially tied up, at least um, potentially, with, with the mood of wonder. But it's a, one of a lot of different kinds of moods that could be tied up with the mood of wonder. But 
This particular one is very crucial to the medieval Christian world. Um, I was fast, I didn't know this, I feel like I should have known this. I was fascinated to discover and thinking about this and researching this, that it's built into the very vocabulary of medieval Latin. So the Latin verb mirror, mirari, miratus sum, which is the word from which our noun, mirror, uh, derives, um, literally means to be amazed at or to look at with wonder. So the mood of wonder is tied up with this reflective experience of seeing yourself being seen. And that's built in, to, at least in the medieval Latin context, and it's built right in to the vocabulary. So the mood of wonder is important, I think, but it's important for a second obvious reason. Um, it's the mood in which philosophy itself begins. Plato and Aristotle tell us there was already an ancient sort of known fact about philosophy by the time they were writing, that philosophy begins in wonder. Uh, I think that the wonder that you find in the pre-Socratics is obviously not the same kind of wonder that you find in the medieval, in this medieval Christian reflective seeing of oneself being seen. Uh, but it's a mood that pervades everything, and it's a mood in the context of which uh, things can be presented to you as the things that they are. What the two of them seem to me to have in common uh, is that um, there, there's an essential contingency tied up with both of them. When you hear Heidegger talk about his interpretation of the pre-Socratics, his interpretation of thusis as the understanding of being of the pre-Socratic world, of this whooshing up and hanging out for a while and then receding, what's clear about it in his description at any rate is that what gets it going is that the philosophers who are taken over by this mood recognize its contingency. They recognize that things didn't have to be that way. And it's in the context of that recognition that the question, which is the question that Heidegger thinks is so central for philosophy, uh, the question, why is there anything at all and why is it the way that it is, makes sense. It makes sense only against the background of the idea that you're taken over by a mood that colors everything as being a certain way, and it's part of being taken over that, by that mood that you experience that as not having to have been that way. That contingency is built in a very particular way into the medieval Christian conception of God. It's only by virtue of God's love that you're saved, let's say, and you didn't have to do it. Nothing in the universe of logic or anything else constrains him to do it. That's what's so risky about it. That's what's so scary about it. That's also why we need to be so grateful if it happens. But, and it happens very differently according to Heidegger's reading of the pre-Socratics, but what they have in common is this essential contingency, needing to have been that way, that's built into the mood itself. Um, I, I think what's interesting is that um, this might help to explain, sort of drawing this connection between Nicholas and the pre-Socratics, or the ancient tradition of philosophy more generally. This famous claim by Pierre Adot, since we're in Paris, we should mention Pierre Adot, um, that from the earliest times philosophy in the ancient world wasn't a mere intellectual pursuit, but a whole way of life, a whole set of practices that were meant to bring about a whole mood against the background of which you could experience things as being the way they are. Um, what I don't want to interpret Ado's claim, but uh, that is his view about what philosophy is, and if philosophy begins in wonder, we can see why uh, philosophy understood that way would have this, this practical character to it. Um, what's interesting to me is that by the time of the medieval Latins, philosophy had already stopped being that way, at least if you um, think about it the way Albert, uh, Albertus Magnus, Albert the Great did, he distinguishes between philosophy and theology, and he says, look, they're both interested in God. The philosopher contemplates God insofar as he takes him in some kind of demonstrative conclusion, but the theologian contemplates him as he exists beyond reason and understanding. The theologian depends upon the first truth for its own sake, not because of reason, though he has reason too. Hence, the theologian remains in awe, remains in this mood of wonder, though the philosopher doesn't. It seems to me that Nicholas's devotional practice of attending with others to the omnivoyant gaze of an inanimate object is one of the ways that the inhuman gaze could ground the possibility of awe or wonder. So that's the end of the 
longer second part of my paper. How much time have I got left? Lots of time. Lots of time. Good. Okay. So I um so I this is now I want to go to the second part of the paper, which is shorter because it's more familiar, but it will end with a story, so you won't fall asleep. So, um, I mean, here's an obvious problem. Uh, it's not a necessary fact that you have to experience the omnivoyant gaze of God in the mood of wonder. You can imagine all sorts of other moods that, uh, in the context of which you might experience the omnivoyant gaze of God. Nietzsche, I think, is the most famous example of it. He just <laughs> thought it was um, sort of pathetic and drove him to distraction, the, the idea that the world should be that way. So you could experience this omnivoyant gaze of God, as I think Nietzsche did, as an inappropriately felt limitation upon human possibility. So there's Nietzsche, and you can see him feeling that. <laughs> so here, here he is, and he tells a characteristic story in the preface to the gay science, which is just on this topic. He, uh, so he's commenting, you might remember, upon this famous uh, poem by Schiller about a bunch of Egyptian youths who run into the town square and take the veil off a ritually covered statue. And he says, uh, as for our future, I think I actually have it. Yeah. As for our future, uh, one will hardly find us again on the paths of those Egyptian youths who endanger temples by night, embrace statues, and want by all means to unveil, uncover, and put into a bright light whatever is kept concealed for good reasons. No, this bad taste, this will to truth, to truth at any price, this youthful madness in the love of truth have lost their charm for us. For that we are too experienced, too serious, too merry, too burned, too profound. We no longer believe that truth remains truth when the veils are withdrawn. We've lived too much to believe this. Today we consider it a matter of decency not to wish to see everything naked or to be present at everything or to understand and know everything. Is it true that God is present everywhere? A little girl asked her mother. I think that's indecent, <laughs> I hint for philosophers. So you could experience this omnivoyance of God, this all seenness of God, as something totally indecent and to be rejected. And that's the way Nietzsche experienced it. And so his aim is the opposite of Nicholas's aim. Nietzsche believes that there's something indecent, something appalling, something in bad taste about the idea of a God who sees everything. And he believes that the related idea of a pure and unveiled truth is naive as well. Truth understood in this way is tied inexorably to the idea that God's view reveals things as they are, reveals, as Nicholas says, the substance of things. This gaze that's coming from everywhere sees right to your core in Nicholas's experience of it. But the will to truth, the will to see things in their unvarnished form, as one might in the context of the mystic union with God, this will to truth is a kind of madness, it's a kind of disease for Nietzsche. Indeed, it's a disease that hides the true health of humanity, the health grounded in what he calls in uh, The Will to Power, a positive nihilism that recognizes no limitation or boundary that the world places upon us, seeing it instead as a canvas upon which one must paint one's masterpiece. Uh, he says in the gay science, science gives style to one's existence. Um, that means, I take it, experience the whole, not as thoroughly invested with the omnivoyant gaze of God, but as the unbounded sea waiting for us to will a meaning upon it. That's Nietzsche's view. So like Nicholas, Nietzsche recognizes that somehow He's trying to invoke a new mood, a, not an experience of this, that, or the other thing, but a whole mood in the context of which we'll experience everything that is. And we we're going to experience it as un, an unbounded sea waiting for us to form it and place a meaning upon it. Uh, so like Nicholas, Nietzsche recognizes that you can't bring about this kind of gestalt shift, this change in the whole mood of existence through an argument, 
And of course, Nietzsche's writing is famously lacking in arguments. Uh, from his genealogies, to his aphorisms, to his parables, to his awful poetry and music. Um, I, I sometimes play his piano music for my classes. Have you ever heard it? <laughs> Don't do it. Okay. Um, but there's, uh, it, his goal is to, there's this um, sort of phrase from Montaigne, to soften the heart of his reader. That's what Montaigne wants to do. He wants, he asks, how do you do this? What a puzzling thing for us to be able to soften the heart of our reader, to make the reader sort of um, sympathetic with us, to soften his heart. Uh, and that's what Nietzsche wants to do. Like Pascal before him, Nietzsche knows, I mean, in every other way, they're the opposite. But like Pascal, Nietzsche knows that you can't will yourself to a whole new mood, uh, nor can you be argued into it to achieve a whole gestalt shift in our experience, to bring it about that people see, see the world as fully replete with God's gaze or as fully lacking it, either one, you have to use rhetoric and practice, not argument and will. Furthermore, uh, the person who wants to bring about this change has to be called to bring it about. They have to experience it as a necessary or a needful change for the culture. Nietzsche, uh, despite the fact that he really thinks, I think, in Heidegger's reading at any rate, that uh, we are ultimately will to power that forms the meaning of things, he recognizes that he's called to bring it about that we experience ourselves this way. Uh, he, he, we have to experience it as necessary or needful that people experience uh, themselves as the site of will to power. Nietzsche says this again in the Gay Science. This is aphorism 290. He says, for one thing is needful, that a human being should attain, should bring it about by force of will, his own satisfaction with himself. Now Nicholas and Nietzsche both experience the world as already demanding of them that they bring about others to see it in the way they do. And in a sense, they were both successful. Uh, the world looked different as a whole uh, after Nicholas's work took root and also after Nietzsche's work did. It's Nietzsche's success, for instance, that explains Camus' ability to articulate so well the experience of our existence as absurd, on the one hand, demanding the world to be meaningful and significant, while on the other hand, recognizing its utter incapacity to be that way. It's only because Nietzsche sort of allowed us to experience the world that way that Camus could say what he did. And it's why in the contemporary world we can come to have experienced the utter lack of God's infinite and inhuman gaze, or else to have experienced it as having taken an utterly debased form. Now, there's an amazing example of uh, this utterly debased form of God. It's found in a short story by Kafka. Um, and it was central, this story, to Adorno's argument for what he called an inverted theology. Um, read Peter Gordon's book, Adorno in Existence, if you want to learn about this. It's, it's a terrific book, although it's clear that Adorno doesn't understand Heidegger at all. But still, the book uh, about Adorno is good, and um, in this, and, and this story by Kafka is important for Adorno. And in this story, Kafka presents the debased image of God in a creature that he calls Odradek. Uh, now, far from being omnivoyant, Odradek sees the world from a completely neglected and estranged and unique and singular point of view. His gaze is inhuman too, partly because it's the gaze of a thing, but also partly because it's the gaze of a never dying entity. It's just it's what's remaining of God. It doesn't die, but it's this sort of neglected object. Uh, it's the never dying manifestation in Adorno's reading of a suffering that makes our own actual despair seem insignificant. Adorno says the story portrays hell seen from the perspective of salvation. God is living in hell, and that's why we can still have hope uh, on Adorno's reading. Now, I, I want to end with this story. I'm going to read you. It's about a page. Um, not because I think, as Adorno does, that the mood of estrangement in which Kafka experiences the world is the correct one, nor do I think, as some nostalgic types might, that the mood of wonder at God's omnivoyance in which Nicholas experiences the world is the one to be retrieved. Rather, 
It's the juxtaposition of these opposites that strikes me as worthy of note. Perhaps in the recognition that both of these are moods, both of these moods are possibilities for us, and that therefore each is contingent and dependent upon both our practices for evoking them and our sensitivity for the need to do so, that we can find the courage to stand in wonder before what is. Perhaps, in other words, we can manage to adopt the posture of the phenomenological reduction as Merleau Ponty describes it, the posture of what Merleau Ponty did in the face of the world. So I end with this story from Kafka, which is called The Cares uh, of a Family Man. I will uh, read the story in its entirety. There's Kafka. I'll read the story in its entirety um, because it's short. So here it is, Kafka read. The Cares of a Family Man. Some say the word Odradek is of Slavonic origin and try to account for it on that basis. Others again believe it to be of German origin, only influenced by Slavonic. The uncertainty of both interpretations allows one to assume with justice that neither is accurate, especially as neither of them provides an intelligent meaning of the word. No one, of course, would occupy himself with such studies if there were not a creature called Odradek. At first glance, it looks like a flat, star-shaped spool for thread. And indeed, it does seem to have thread wound upon it. To be sure, they are only old, broken-off bits of thread, knotted and tangled together of the most varied sorts and colors. But it is not only a spool, for a small wooden crossbar sticks out of the middle of the star, and another small rod is joined to that at a right angle. By means of this latter rod, on one side, and one of the points of the star on the other, the whole thing can stand upright, as if on two legs. This is an artist's rendition of Odradek. You just found it on the internet. <laughs> one is tempted to believe that the creature once had some sort of intelligible shape and is now only a broken down remnant. Yet this does not seem to be the case. At least there is no sign of it. Nowhere is there an unfinished or unbroken surface to suggest anything of the kind. The whole thing looks senseless enough, but in its own way, perfectly finished. In any case, closer scrutiny is impossible since Odredek is extraordinarily nimble and can never be laid hold of. He lurks by turns in the garret, the stairway, the lobbies, the entrance hall. Often for months on end, he's not to be seen then he has presumably moved into other houses, but he always comes faithfully back to our house again. Many a time when you go out of the door and he happens just to be leaning directly beneath you against the banisters, you feel inclined to speak to him. Of course, you put no difficult questions to him. You treat him. He is so diminutive that you cannot help it, rather like a child. Well, what's your name? You ask him. Over deck, he says. And where do you live? No fixed abode, he says, and laughs. But it's only the kind of laughter that has no lungs behind it. It sounds rather like the rustling of fallen leaves. And that's usually the end of the conversation. Even these answers are not always forthcoming. Often he stays mute for a long time, as wooden as his appearance. I ask myself, to no purpose, what is likely to happen to him? Can he possibly die? Anything that dies has had some kind of aim in life, some kind of activity, which is worn out, but that doesn't apply to Odredek. Am I to suppose, then, that he will always be rolling down the stairs with ends of thread trailing after him, right before the feet of my children and my children's children? He does no harm to anyone that one can see, but the idea that he is likely to survive me I find almost painful. Thanks. For an outstanding paper, you made my timekeeping uh, very easy, uh, right on the bottom as a novel. So, thank you very much. Questions? Thank you, John. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I, I, I wonder if you could help me through like, uh, uh, what the, the human version of this means. So, I mean, after all, uh, the, the Wonder Maiden example is, is a, a human's gains. Uh, 
and she's just so vividly uh, attentive and uh, absorbed. Yeah. Uh, but 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 uh, even nothing in particular is a portrait. Um, but I mean, if you think, think of like a genre painting more generally, right? Like uh, Hegel's lectures on aesthetics is that wonderful passage about the industrious Dutch and how they brought the uh, concept of beauty low to the vulgar and to every the sure particularities of, of life, right? And so to think of like uh, uh, Roger Bork's uh, painting of like a, a boy picking lice from. Uh, his dog's hair, or, or a woman peeling apples, and they have like the same kind of physiognomy of absorption, but in like the deeply particular. Uh, I'm just, oh, I'm wondering, it, it, like, what, what, what is the human version of, uh, of this case? Could it, would it be something like that? I, I, I don't know. So you're you're asking, what's the human version of the gaze of the of the icon upon me? Is that the is that the question? Or the human, I don't know, inhabitation of. But, I don't know. I, I mean, so I think there are two. We can separate um, two two things. Uh, I mean, you know, one is the um, the thing that Michael Friedman made made famous in in art history. This sort of this um, image of absorption, of being absorbed in some task. He has the uh, the discussion of the Chardin, the boy blowing a bubble, and what he's giving us is an image of. He's supposed to be giving us, according to Michael, uh, an image of uh, the experience of being completely absorbed in whatever activity you're absorbed in. I think that's a thing that we can experience. Maybe that's something like a flow state. Maybe that's something like what Heidegger's interested in talking about. Maybe Heidegger's um, hammerers have, have got it. Uh, but that's not what Nicholas is talking about. What Nicholas is talking about is somehow the experience of someone else's gaze being entirely absorbed in you. Yeah. So now you have to experience, I don't know, something like two lovers gazing at one, gazing at one another with um, adoration and the experience of being gazed at by your lover with adoration in her eyes or in his eyes. That experience of being completely consumed by the love of another through the gaze that they have for you, then the care that they have for you. They're the sense that they will never desert you if you actually have that in that experience. I think that's what Nicholas is after, and he wants us to try to experience that in the context of the gaze of the icon upon us, throughout the movement of, of us in positions of space, and then to experience the fact that others are currently experiencing it that way as well. It's a very complicated experience, as he says. I don't think you can talk yourself into it. Maybe you can, through these kinds of exercises, come yourself come come to bring it about in yourself that you have that experience. Um, I, I don't I don't know what it would be entirely, although you can sort of imagine it. So I think it's something like that. Okay. Yes, I just had a little uh, association I wanted to share, which was um, uh, kind of you bring up this sort of this beautiful the, the, the Albinelli leaping and the, the, collect, the collectiveness of the leap. And then on the other hand, there was the issue of the, the embracing of contradiction. Yes. Well, um, Nicholas Van Kusa once remarked that the definition of a polygon is it's a, big, it's a closed figure with many sides. Yes. And the definition of a circle is it's a closed figure with one side. But somehow, by adding sides to a figure and making more and more and more of them, you end up with a circle. Yeah. And he called that the leap of faith. Excellent, excellent, thank you. I know that, so I'm just sort of diving into Nicholas and I, I do know that he's very consumed with geometry and I know that's important for the modern reception of him in Kassira and so on, but thanks for that, Albert, that's terrific, yeah. Hi, uh, thank you for your wonderful talk. Um, I think Clinton said that uh, just with a background in comparative uh, literature, I'm very interested in this concept of omnivoyance from a two-point, uh, two-fold perspective. Uh, first of all, because it's like um, a political figure, uh, with Wilke, for example, with, with a phenomenological point, with the things staring back at you. For example, in the famous poem, A Cave Torso of Holland, oh, yeah. where uh, the, the poet stands in front of this torso and suddenly it's filled with eyes staring at him, and he feels that he has to change his life, so it becomes imperative. And it makes me think of, you show this very wonderful picture of, of the god covered with eyes, yes. which is a very prominent figure with schizophrenic patients' drawings. They are filled with eyes. I don't know if you know the, the poet uh, Uni Katsuyan, she's Swiss, and she was also a surrealist a painter married to um, Hans Bormann. Okay. Yeah, and she, her drawings are filled with these eyes, gazing. 
And in the schizophrenic universe, um, it's interesting in, in, uh, in comparison to um, the German psychiatrist Conrad, who is also pedagogical, inspired, who made this um, very nice description of pre delusional mood. Uh, when in the beginning there is trauma, there's anxiety, there's something unheimlich is going on, something is wrong. And then there's this sudden uh, epiphany, this feeling that everything is. is uh, is talking to you, that there are signs and symbols coming in, being intrusive somehow, eh? wanting to tell you something, and then there's the epiphanic um, uh, experience of, of the delusion, yes. that now I understand everything, it's because the CIA is uh, surveying me, and now that's, and that's the explanation. Right, right. Good, thank you. I was hoping that I would get lots of examples from the psychiatrists in the room, and that, so just, um, I'll put the, the image back up. Um, so, uh, it, right, so these kinds of images of bodies with eyes all over them or eyes all over the world, I think are, very, are quite common. They're com very common in the mystical literature as I understand it. And, uh, you know, there's, a, there's um, I think, some psychiatric literature um, sort of taking Hildegard as a kind of case study. One of the things they say about her is that all these all these stars that are shining everywhere not in, not so much in this image but in, in lots of the others I guess down here um, uh, people will say um, oh it, it, it's a it's a pre migraine or something like that you, you get these sort of these flashes of light and so I, I think it's I'm sure it's true that we now have people who have experiences like this of course in our cultural context they don't mean anything like what they meant for Hildegard, and that's that's interesting. It may well be that it's impossible now to experience those as having the significance that they did in the 11th or 12th century. Um, and uh, but I but I still think it's interesting to ask ourselves what we're supposed to make of them. It's not obvious to me that they ne they need necessarily to be a manifestation of an illness that has to be treated. Maybe they do. Maybe in some cases they do, but maybe not always. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you for a great talk. Um, I hope you forgive me if I'm uh, going to stretch the scope of the first part of your talk farther than it was meant to go. Uh, but my interest was piqued when you talked about uh, when contemplating God, uh, there would be a breakdown of the laws of Aristotelian logic. Mm. Um, that pondering the ground of being involves this sort of, uh, you have to accommodate the breakdown of the law of non contradiction. Yeah. And, um, I thought maybe there's a parallel or a certain inheritance between uh, Rousseau's idea and uh, transcendental subjectivity in, in phenomenology. Mm. Um, so we have described God as sort of the ground of all being, yeah. equally present for all, but uh, uh, for, for each one, intimately close, uh, not an entity or an object, not following objectual logic. Um, and so I wonder uh, if, if you think that there's a connection between that and Husserl's transcendental subjectivity, which is, again, it's not human, uh, it's not reducible to the empirical eye, he says they're only the same by equivocation, um, it's the ground for being it constitutes, and so and he talks about the paradox of, uh, of human subjectivity, transcendental subjectivity. Yeah. Um, so I'm wondering if you think that, one, if there's a parallel there, and then two, if something about the breakdown of laws of logic will always happen when, uh, when the knower tries to know itself, or when you cut a ground. Okay, so good. So I um, wasn't thinking about it in the context of Husserl, though maybe Sean and Dan, I stand still here, maybe Sean and Dan, or there's Dan, maybe Sean and Dan are, I was thinking of it in the context of Heidegger, I was thinking of it as, you know, the, um, the embrace of the ontological difference, being is not an entity, uh, which, is, which is the way Heidegger thinks about it, to the extent that you can, uh, or the ground of being is not an entity, as he says later uh, in, in the later work, to the extent that you can, um, Think about Husserl as embracing a, a view like that, a, a sort of uh, embrace of the ontological dif difference in the context of the interpretation of transcendental subjectivity, then sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, I, I, I don't have strong views. Well, I probably do, but I don't want to say them <laughs> <laughs> later over beer. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so wh whether it, whether it if, if you have that interpretation of Husserl, then I think it could apply to, to that. Certainly, I think it applies to, to that interpretation of, of Heidegger uh, with his emphasis on the importance of the ontological difference. And that's actually what, what led me uh, in reading late Heidegger to try to think about the, 
think about the medieval mystics. It wasn't, as far as I understand, Nicholas, who was the one primarily important for Heidegger. It, um, it was Eckhart, uh, who was important for Nicholas. Um, but Nicholas has this really cool exercise that worked for our themes. So. Yeah. Thank you very much, Charles. That was a fascinating talk. I guess I had uh, sort of comments and a question. The first was, I guess, the sort of side gap my, my colleagues have already. Yeah. So I guess the Langian appropriation of Sartre is to make that kind of point that the world is all gays. Yeah. And I guess he would probably equate with uh, the Nietzschean point about that, that that's indecent. Right. Yeah. Lack of privacy, right. that shame, uh, that hyper reflexivity that comes in it is there when the intent and, and the illness comes from it. I guess that certainly seemed to resonate yeah. very closely. Um, second point, I was very intrigued about the, the later Heidegger and the Christian mysticism link. Yeah. Specifically, I guess, this, the later Heidegger is sometimes accused of being having a sort of element of quietism in him. You know, only the gods can save us, kind of passivity, and perhaps that relates to previous crystal involvement. But is there any attempt to kind of uh, evoke his readers, his, his students, into kind of spiritual exercises that kind of accuse the uh, uh, described the monks? Try and bring on a sense of wonder to bring the gods close back again. Okay, excellent question. Uh, so, uh, so I'll just tell you sort of the background. The other course I was teaching this semester was is a, 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 sem a graduate seminar on, Foucault, on late Foucault on the Collège de France lecture that's on the hermeneutics of the subject. That's all about the practices of the care uh, for the care of the self from Plato to Augustine. So Foucault is definitely interested in what are the practices that we can engage ourselves in that will count as practices of caring for ourselves that will, by counting as that, come to constitute ourselves as this kind of being rather than this kind. He traces the change in these practices. He's very interested in the practices. Heidegger, as far as I can tell, certainly in the late work, is not at all interested in the practices. Um, I, think, I think partly because he thinks of himself as before that. I think he is interested uh, in the idea that we need to be engaged in some practice. Uh, now, and uh, I mean, insofar as there's a name for it, one of the names for it is thinking, and he gives a, there's lots of stuff in the later Heidegger about what thinking amounts to and how you can find yourself involved in it, but it's also murky that there's nothing like a, you know, an exercise that you could engage in. Um, but, but I do think that he's that way because he thinks of him as sort of not really at the point of being able to prescribe exercises. He's at the point of really, I think he thinks of himself as a prophet, being able to point forward to the time when there will be somebody who prescribes exercises. And he can say something about the form that they'll take. And that's, I think, the form that I was trying to encourage us to think about these two stories in the context of. Not that we should stand in the mood of wonder by virtue of the kind of exercises that Nicholas prescribes, or in the mood of sort of the sense of indecency uh, by, you know, by virtue of the kind of thing that Nietzsche tells us about or Kafka, but that somehow the idea that we're the kinds of beings that can shift whole moods in, across periods of history, and that to do that involves two things. One, to be sensitive to the need for a shift in a mood. That's what Nietzsche was sensitive to. One thing is needful. Um, and two, to recognize that um, that need will never be brought about by any kind of argument or cognitive act or spontaneous act of the will, that it's going to require some different kind of thing. And I think, I think, Nietzsche, I think to the extent that Heidegger is involved in something like the prescription of practices, it's in the style of his writing, which is supposed to be a new way of writing about our condition. Um, I think, may, arguably, it fails. Uh, but in any, in any case, I think he's pointing ahead to the idea that that's what we need to be doing. And time is pressing on, so uh, only two more, Sean. Yeah, uh, David Freeberg and uh, Victoria Galesa have this theory about you know, art and what, uh, that, you know, looking at the picture with a woman looking at you uh, would make your mirror neurons fire. Simulating himself, I don't really believe it. But uh, um, it, it, why? Why is the uh, why is that exercise based on the, that art rather than another per, an actual other person? You could have the same thing. You could have that experience of God by looking at the eyes of the other person, or have, having the gaze. I well, good. Okay, so. 
I, I think it's because you don't actually get that experience with the person. There's something, I, I don't know how it works, but there's something about what he calls the subtle artistry, of, subtle pictorial artistry of the thing that allows it to be the case that even though her eyes are pointing in one direction, you experience them as pointing in every direction. And, and if you walked across the room as I was looking there, you wouldn't get that experience. Well, I'd have to follow it. I mean, you would have to follow it. That's right, but that's what's not happening here. It's supposed to be, it's, there's supposed to be an inherent paradox in the experience. Her eyes are evidently not moving and yet they're following you. And that I don't think you can get with an actual person. Yeah. Just to carry on that, that discussion, that's generally true of eyes that look out from portraits. They will follow you around. Yes. That doesn't require great expertise with facets of images. It's, a, it's important though, I think, that it was the Veronica, not this particular image that was used. Yes. The Veronica is not a kind of boetum. It was an image not made by human hand, but obtained that's by direct right. transfer from Christ's face itself. So and that's this is how icons work. Icons put you, in, right. icons put you in contact with the original Good. in a very, very meaningful sense. So that got skipped over. That's right. very helpful, and I think it's true. Of course, the image, as I say, the image that he refers to the, of Rogers is is lost now. Um, and so, but most people think it was a Veronica, and as you say, the Veronica's akira poetam. That's yeah. right, not made by the hand of man. Yeah. Uh, and so that's supposed to somehow involve you in the experience of the whole thing as a, a, a gaze of God. Yeah, ex yeah, exactly. Good, that's that's super helpful. Okay, I have to shut it down, I'm under strict instructions. Okay, so yes. thank you very much.